Uh, you can start now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. This is Krishnan uh, from CCCR, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. Uh, today I will be talking about climate science and earth system modeling progress and prospects uh, during this MOES webinar. So first of all, I want to thank uh, our secretary, Dr. M. Rajivan, and our director, Dr. Professor Ravi Nanjundaya, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, my presentation uh, is the work that has come out from working with the entire team at CCCR and several IATM colleagues, my student postdocs. And I want to thank all of them and from so many people from whom I have learned many things in my life. So, so this is, I am uh, very grateful to all of you and my humble pranam. So with this, let me go with my, begin my presentation. Uh, I will just share my screen. Oh, sorry, just a minute. Screen. Share. Share, share. Yeah, just a minute. Huh. Application. Mm -hmm. Application. Select, share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you see this screen? Are you able to see the screen? Yes, please go to full screen mode. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So this talk will be on the climate science and earth system modeling progress and prospects. And uh, basically, this is the outline of my talk. I will uh, give an introduction, brief introduction about the Center for Climate Change Research at I IATM Pune, the science of climate change and earth system processes, the progress and weather, progress in weather and climate modeling. Uh, basically, two success stories of the NWP and the climate modeling, this addressing the science of climate change, these two are success stories. And what are our efforts at IATM, uh, the development of the Earth System model, uh, IATM Earth System model and the projections. And I will also talk about uh, our recent assessment of the climate change report over the Indian region. This is a report of the Ministry of Earth Sciences uh, from the Government of India. And this was led by our center and contributions from various experts from India and also abroad. I will be highlighting this uh, report as well. And there are various knowledge gaps in our understanding of climate change, especially when we talk at a regional scale. There are uncertainties in the scenarios, unresolved physical processes, internal variability of the climate system, and among several others. I'll be briefly touching upon the, those issues. And I also want to use this to highlight the opportunities in weather and climate modeling. <clears throat> and in the coming years and the government of in india uh, initiative to reduce ghg emissions so this is the plan of my talk so the center for climate change research uh, started in uh, it was officially approved in 2009 and the formal recruitment and functioning of the center at iatm started in 2010 and uh, so it's been a little over 10 years and the main objectives of the center was to build an earth system model for addressing the science of climate change, including the detection, attribution and future projection of global and regional climate change and to develop and to address key scientific issues on long term climate change and build the human capacity within the country to address these uh, issues related to modeling and climate change issues. And also the second objective uh, with regard to the science of climate change at regional scales was to develop high resolution regional climate change scenarios 
for the South Asia, for the Indian region known as Cordex Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment. And in addition, there are various observational programs to understand the greenhouse gas concentrations, their fluxes, biogeochemical processes, soil moisture and land surface processes, and the variations across different ecosystems of the Indian region. This is known as the mid-flux. There is also an observational program to understand the past climatic changes over India and South Asia, particularly the monsoons, using multi, multiple proxy records. This is a part of our paleoclimate work. And we are also having a programs on observational and modeling studies of atmospheric chemistry, trace gases, and links to climate. So this talk, uh, I'll be essentially focusing on the first two, uh, focusing on the Earth system model and the high resolution projections and briefly uh, show what are our observational activities. Uh, uh, so one of the main achievements of the center is the development of an Earth system model for long-term uh, climate change studies. This is known as the IATM Earth system model. This is developed indigenously by our center. And this model is now contributing to the CMIP-6 experiments and to the IPCC sixth assessment report. This is the first time from India. I will be highlighting this is a fully coupled model, uh, climate model, and uh, I'll be uh, discussing this in my talk. And uh, the other aspect is the, the CORDEX, the Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment, uh, where we have developed ensemble projections at 50 kilometer resolution of the regional climate scenarios for the future. And uh, this is also used in our assessment report, this CORDEX data sets. And this data is being distributed uh, through what is known as the Earth System uh, Grid Federation node. It has been set up and globally this data is accessible to everyone, both the CMIP-6 projections as well as the CARDEX projections. And, uh, and our plans, I will be highlighting our plans for a global high resolution 27 kilometer version of the IATM Earth System model that we are developing. And some experiments have already started. This is our future plan. And with regard to the observational activities that I have just summarized in one slide of CCCR, we have a very vibrant uh, program looking at the past climatic variations over India. This has been there in IATM for quite some time. And this is now part of CCCR. We are looking at the uh, climatic variations, uh, both in temperature records and the precipitation, the monsoon variations uh, using tree rings and also uh, which is which is now available for more than 500, 600 years uh, record in the Himalayan region, in peninsular India, in central India, and so on. And we are also having now a program uh, looking at cave deposit, the speleotherms, looking at the oxygen isotope. And these reconstructions have given, uh, uh, provided information about monsoon variations extending back to almost 9,000, 10,000 years during the Holocene. Uh, there is also an observational program uh, for GHG monitoring, uh, greenhouse gas monitoring. Just like the Monolova Observatory, we have an observatory at Sinhagat. This started in 2009 and continuous measurements of uh, CO2 and methane are being made. And those samples are analyzed at IATM. The samples are collected in flask and uh, these, then they are analyzed at IATM in a gas chromatograph. In addition, there are GHG flux measurements to understand the sources and sinks of uh, greenhouse gases in different ecosystems. And this is important for understanding the net ecosystem exchange. And we have measurements of uh, GHG fluxes at, at the Pichavaram mangrove and also from the Kaziranga National Park. And, uh, and uh, we are also ma making measurements of soil moisture and land surface processes at IATM Pune uh, using a uh, what is known as a cosmos soil moisture measurement system and this has been going on uh, it's a very high resolution data for almost last three years we have uh, made this measurement trying to understand the land surface interactions how <clears throat> and the changes in the monsoonal precipitation how it affects the soil moisture and its feedbacks and the impacts on temperature variations in the region including extremes and there is a program on atmospheric chemistry and trace gases uh, this is uh, this involves a lot of expeditions in the uh, Southern Ocean and Antarctica. This work is partly done in collaboration with the NCPOR in Goa and uh, trying to look at the ha uh, quantify halogen sources in the marine boundary layer 
and also there are measurements of ozone uh, uh, profiles in antarctica uh, there are uh, as a part of this we are also looking at water vapor and trace gases in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere uh, trying to understand how these uh, very small amount small concentrations of water vapor in this uh, greenhouse gas in the uh, upper troposphere how they vary and what happens during the summer monsoon season when the monsoon convection takes these trace gases all the way into the utls region this is done through balloon sonde satellites and model x model model simulations so this is a quick summary of the observational activities so now basically i will focus on the earth system modeling uh, work at iitm so the question is why study the earth system uh, basically life exists nearly everywhere on the earth because the climate is favorable and the earth system it comprises of different components the atmosphere the ocean land cryosphere that is the ice and the biosphere so they are all continuously they are interacting and it's very important to understand climate by interactions among these different components and natural variations of the climate system they can they are known to arise from these interactive feedbacks uh, on different space and time scales life forms organisms biogeochemical processes uh, for example the carbon cycle they also actively contribute to climate variability so there is a lot of natural variability in the, within the climate system it's very important to understand that in the background uh, but since this uh, following the industrial revolution since the 19th century human activities have also significantly altered the climate and there is strong evidence for that the earth's climate system and uh, so what is the role of human activities how how they have affected the hum, uh, global climate and the regional climate that is one of the important uh, goal understanding that is an important goal of the cccr so basically earth system science integrates various discipline various disciplines so it is truly multidisciplinary it involves physics chemistry mathematics biology meteorology oceanography ecology geology environmental science solar space physics troposphere stratosphere mesosphere chemistry marine and terrestrial biogeochemistry carbon cycle agriculture industry human activities economic social science philosophy policy and all so so it's a very important discipline that's what i wanted to highlight in my talk and uh, so when we say climate climate of a planet basically depends on the energy from the sun and uh, the planetary albedo how much is reflected whatever the incoming there's incoming energy but significant portion of that is reflected so what is it depends on the albedo of the planetary albedo of the planetary albedo it also depends on the planetary rotation rate the mass of the planet the radius of the planet and very importantly the atmospheric composition <coughs> composition like water vapor and carbon dioxide ozone clouds and the distribution of the ocean land and topography so this is what is essentially going to determine main determinants of the climate of a planet and when we look at the the temperature of the const, uh, the constant temperature of a planet it means basically there is a energy there is a radiative energy balance so when we have a balance between the incoming sunlight uh, and the outgoing infrared radiation the emitted infrared radiation the balance between the incoming and the outgoing radiation that is what sets the temperature of the constant temperature of the planet but then there are these greenhouse gases that is in the in the earth's atmosphere they are going to affect the infrared radiation that is emitted and that is going to modify the the temperature of the planet and uh, so when we start looking at the earth's energy balance we know that the solar radiation is about 1380 watts per meter squared at the top of the atmosphere and when we do a simple calculation between the incoming and the outgoing uh, so we have a albedo uh, of about 30% so the incoming energy is basically 1 minus whatever is reflected back into the solar constant and multiplied by the area of the disk uh, because the energy is basically coming falling on a disk whereas the outgoing radiation is emitted by the entire globe so you are multiplying by 4 pi r square and when we do this balance between the incoming and outgoing and uh, we know the measured albedo of the planet it's about 0.3 and the uh, emission by the planetary emission is about 237 watts per meter squared 
if you do the simple calculation, the effective temperature of the planet should be around 255 degrees Kelvin or about minus 18 degrees. But when you look at the actual surface energy uh, that is emitted by the planet, it's about 390 watts per meter squared. It's much higher, not 237. And the temperature of the planet is plus 15 degrees or 288 degree Kelvin. So the difference is not minus 18, it is plus 15. So the difference is about 33 degree Kelvin, which is known as the greenhouse effect. And this is basically, this is the amount of energy that is trapped by these uh, greenhouse gas uh, gases in the atmosphere that maintain the warm uh, warm temperatures in the planet and makes life possible. And uh, when we look at the spectrum of the uh, uh, radiation, uh, basically when you look at the radiation intensity in, uh, in different wavelengths, we have the maximum uh, incoming solar radiation in the visible in the 0.4 to 0.8 uh, microns and uh, the outgoing radiation is mostly in the infrared radiation. And, uh, and when we start looking at the absorption of the, uh, both the incoming and the outgoing, you see that the in incoming radiation, mostly the absorption is in the, in the ultraviolet by ozone in the stratosphere. Very little uh, in, in the troposphere, there is absorption. And, uh, but when you look at the, uh, there is some outgoing radiation that is absorbed at around 10, 10 microns is mostly coming from the water vapor. Uh, but much of the water absorption, when we see the carbon dioxide absorption in the infrared is around 12 microns or so, it is all in the infrared. And likewise, you see water vapor absorption are around 8, eight 9 microns, 7, 8 microns. And uh, basically what you see is the absorption is, much of it is happening in the infrared radiation. This is from a spectral analysis. And, uh, and when we look at the global mean uh, energy budget of the planet, when we try to see what is, how much is incoming and outgoing, uh, there is always a balance. Uh, so you have 100% incoming radiation, 30% reflected by the atmosphere, uh, basically 6% by the atmosphere, 20% by clouds and 4% by the earth surface. And if you see the re energy radiated by the planet, uh, by the earth atmospheric system that is exactly 70%. So the incoming and the net incoming and the net go outgoing are always in balance. And it's very important for climate models to ensure that this energy balance, the incoming and outgoing are maintained. This is very, very important when you develop climate models and earth system models. I will come to that. And, uh, but when you look at, that was a global mean picture, but when we look at the latitudinal distribution of the incoming and the outgoing radiation, uh, there is a, the, 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 the solid line shows the absorbed solar radiation and the dotted line shows the outgoing long wave radiation. The incoming radiation has, has, has got a very uh, bell-shaped structure and uh, whereas the outgoing radiation is more or less flat. And, the net, uh, the result is that in the tropics you have a net gain in the radiation. Uh, there is a the absorption is more compared to the outgoing, whereas when you go to the mid latitudes and higher latitudes there is a net loss. So the difference between the what is absorbed and the outgoing is what is going to drive the atmospheric motions and the circulation, and uh, yeah, and this is what is going to maintain the equator to pole temperature gradients and drive the atmospheric general circulation. And, uh, and also the temperature of the planet is not uniform. It, it has a seasonal uh, cycle that comes because of the tilt of the Earth's axis. And uh, we have the, as we have different seasons, the solar insulation varies. And then we have the seasonal cycle in the, uh, in, in the variation of the temperature, surface temperatures. And uh, so why I'm saying all this is first to understand that Natural variations, even in the Earth orbital forcing, can is known to produce climatic variations, and uh, this is a typical example of the uh, the Earth's orbit uh, around the Sun, which is an elliptical orbit, and uh, and variations in the orbital parameters can lead to variation variations in the solar insulation, and uh, so these variations in the solar insulation have given rise to uh, climatic variations on very long time scales and these are measured from the oxygen isotope uh, records from the deep sea records uh, deep oceans 
and they provide evidence for periods glaciations when period when the earth was dominated by snow snow covered and there are periods when it was what, what we call as interglacial there were warm periods so the their clear evidence for this based on the paleo data how long term orbital forcings have affected uh, variations in the orbital parameters have affected the climate so that's a natural variation uh, likewise volcanic eruptions they can throw a lot of uh, aerosols uh, sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere which can remain for several years and that is also a way to force uh, natural variability in the climate system and uh, this is just an example and uh, so the variations in the albit, uh, orbital parameters uh, it, it, they are known as the milankovic cycles uh, they, they can occur because of changes in the precession uh, the earth's precession and with the time scale is typically around 20000 it's like the wobbling of the earth and uh, this time scale is about 19 20000 year time scale and uh, there could also be variations due to the tilt of the orbit those variations happen on a time scale of about 40000 plus years and on a longer time scale even the eccentricity of the orbit can vary that's about 100000 years so these changes on different uh, orbital parameters and different time scales are known to produce climatic variations and these are known as the milankovic cycles uh, and the one that is very relevant on the shorter time scales less than 20000 years is the precessional effect and we know that about 20000 years back the earth was it is known as the last glacial maximum when there was earth was covered by uh, snow and glaciers and uh, ice covered it was about 20000 years ago and later on in, uh, in the last 10000 years what is referred to as the holocene climate has warmed up and uh, and these are all reflection of the precessional effects and around 6000 years ago the solar radiation was insulation was maximum uh, in the northern hemisphere and uh, and we know this is referred to as the mid holocene uh, climate warming period and during this time uh, the solar insulation basically the perihelion was very close to the autumnal equinox in september and uh, due to the um, um, maximum solar insulation around this time the there is evidence that the itcz had shifted northward during this time from various paleo records from the climate model simulations and the monsoons were very very strong so it was a very warm and wet climate than the present and there is strong evidence for this for the northward shift of the itcz during the mid holocene and uh, so we are also trying to look at this with, with high resolution model experiments how in increasing the insulation during the mid holocene and during this time even the african monsoon was very wet uh, the vegetation it was uh, the vegetation cover was green more greener than we compared in sahara region dust loading was reduced so we are trying to look at the impacts of the solar insulation as well as the green sahara and reduced dust how it influenced the monsoon especially the indian monsoon and uh, there is evidence at this time the indus valley civilization was flourishing around the same time the other civilizations in mesopotamia and the egyptian they also around the, this period were very very uh, their flourishing civilizations it's important to understand what what was the how was the monsoon looking at that time so this is all part of natural variations in the climate system and uh, but now in the since the pre industrial time human activities have started influencing the climate so this is what is known as the i will come to this i will call this as the carbon dioxide problem so uh, the measurements of carbon dioxide first started from the scripps uh, institution in la jolla and uh, later on this observatory was moved to mono lova in, in hawaiian islands and now we have measurements of uh, it's a very pristine environment where the background concentration of the greenhouse gases carbon dioxide and methane are continuously made and we see that carbon dioxide concentrations have increased steadily from the 60s now we have crossed more than 410 parts per million in the atmosphere in the atmospheric concentration by volume and uh, the question is whether it, whether this has led to the warming of the global mean climate and uh, we also have evidence from uh, paleo records that the amount of carbon dioxide they are uh, unprecedented in the in the history at least for the last 800000 years 
and uh, this is the 1950 uh, so in the past the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere never exceeded uh, 300 uh, parts per million by volume but now the current volumes in the, it's a very rapid increase in the last 150 200 years and uh, and uh, the, so this is uh, and not only carbon dioxide other uh, greenhouse gases like methane of course it is in ppb concentration that has also increased significantly uh, but but its greenhouse uh, warming potential is much higher than carbon dioxide and the temperature as of the planet has also warmed by more than one degree uh, during since pre-industrial times so the question is whether this warming what we are seeing we are what we call as global warming or climate change is because of the carbon dioxide increase or is, is it just natural uh, so there is a, and uh, this is the uh, index of the global land and ocean temperature going uh, up to 2019 uh, so you can see the rapid increase of the temperatures in the last 40 50 years and uh, both the land and ocean temperature and uh, so how do you say that how can we attribute that the increase in the temperature is because of the increase in the in the, the greenhouse gases uh, due to human activities since pre-industrial time because of more fossil fuel burning and so on and uh, this is what the ipcc reports done have done uh, right from the 90s they had the series of assessment reports er1 er2 in 1995 then the third assessment report in 2001 and the fourth assessment report which also was received the nobel prize uh, along with al gore and uh, the fifth assessment report the uh, last one but which was published in 2013 and right now we have the sixth assessment re report that is in progress and will be released sometime next year so the series of assessment reports have convincingly shown that this warming cannot be explained just by natural variations it is the effect of human activity so there is unequivocal evidence that uh, human activity has been the main cause for this global climate change and how does this happen this comes because so this is one of the success of climate models i will be mentioning this this happened through what is known as the CMIP coupled model intercomparison program where um, models uh, climate models from different countries different groups they participate and make standard experiments all the group do the same type of experiment and they kind of arrive at a consensus and see what is happening to the what is the effect of climate change and uh, so right now there are more than in the uh, in the fifth assessment report there are more than 30 plus models 35 36 models and in the ar6 the number has gone even higher and uh, in uh, importantly the iatm earth system model is also contributing to the sixth assessment report this is the uh, and the cmip6 activities this first time from india i want to highlight that so there is clear evidence that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal and human activities are the main cause of this and uh, if you do these experiments clearly showed that if you had only natural forcings like uh, irradiance changes at the top of the atmosphere or volcanic effects we cannot produce the warming of the planet which we have seen in the last 50 years cannot be reproduced so that is the main message and uh, there are also other indicators of global climate change for example the spring snow cover in the with the increase in temperature the northern hemispheric spring snow cover has declined in the last few decades the ocean heat content has increased the arctic uh, summer ice has declined this is a very rapid reduction maybe uh, the, the projections are that in the next few decades arctic may be ice free and the global average sea level has increased they are all clear uh, because of the thermal expansion and also due to the melt of the glaciers and the land ice the sea level has increased so there is all multiple lines of evidence pointing to the impact of climate change and which are seen in both atmosphere ocean the cryosphere and so on and uh, this is a, a showing how the regional warming has varied since pre-industrial time this is an average for the period 2006 to uh, 2015 from the special report uh, one one and a half degree uh, special report this is a period uh, from 2016 to uh, 2006 to 15 you can see much of the warming is look is happening uh, annual is around the 
higher latitudes, mostly in the polar regions uh, and in the regions of North America and uh, Europe and also Asia. And the warming is more during the winter time, during the northern winter, December, January, February. Uh, the, the magnitude of warming is less uh, during summer uh, and uh, during the northern summer. So basically the warming is not spatially uniform. You have higher warming at the higher uh, poleward uh, regions, at the extratropical regions and the polar regions. This we have to keep in mind. And now I go to the issue of climate weather and climate modeling. Why it's important? Uh, basically, uh, there are two. One is the weather weather prediction is also a success story, very important success story. And uh, numerical weather prediction. Uh, so weather and climate models, basically, they start from a weather model. And the basic ideas of M NWP were developed more than a century ago by Bjorknes. And basically, he proposed that weather predictions should be possible based on well-established laws of physics and regarded, however, he regarded this as a deterministic problem. And if we have a sufficiently accurate knowledge of the atmospheric initial state, it should be possible to predict future states. So basically, weather prediction was it is an initial value problem. It depends on your initial state of the atmosphere, initial state of the ocean to be able to predict the subsequent evolution. And uh, so and later on this exercise uh, richardson uh, from uk during the world war world war one uh, he tried to attempt to uh, solve these equations numerically by hand but his solutions failed actually and this failure was realized due to some other problem uh, due to problem of uh, uh, very fast growing waves like the gravity waves and the sound waves which he had not eliminated in the initial conditions that was realized much later but his failure was an important exercise in the subsequent progress of the NWP itself. And uh, subsequently, va various obstacles had to be overcome. Uh, a fuller understanding of the atmospheric dynamics and the regular radio sound measurements and la later satellites joined in the 70s. They provided initial conditions and very stable finite difference schemes were developed. Numerical methods were developed. The first ENIAC computer uh, at the University of Pennsylvania came around the uh, mid 40s uh, and a very pioneering experiment numerical integ by Jules Charney, Neumann and Fjortoff on the numerical integration of the barotropic vorticity equation. Uh, this is typically for the mid-latitude region. Uh, it is a basically quasi-geostrophic approximation. But what they showed is you have to eliminate the acoustic and gravity waves but you retain the long planetary waves in the initial condition. And this was the first numerical model of the atmosphere. And uh, this was an important milestone. And uh, later on, uh, Rasby and team, they made a very uh, first successful real-time weather forecast in 1950. Uh, later on, the general circulation of the model was developed by Norman Phillips. This was the first uh, a simple model, a two-level model. And this was used for basically depicting, depicting the monthly and seasonal pattern of the, the changes in the tropospheric circulation. This was the starting point of the general circulation models and climate models, which later on uh, was led, the development was led from GFDL and also at NCAR and various other centers. And powerful electronic computers provided the means of carrying the massive calculations. And in the recent decades, the computational power, there has been a massive increase. And this has really led to major progress in the NWP. And uh, I will show some slides to understand. This is basically when you talk about weather prediction, it's a system, physical system. And uh, when we say system, we have to define by its components, its interactions, and uh, the environment in which it is situated and the boundary distinguishing the system from its environment. This, this, we have to understand this. And also the most general and fundamental property of the system is the interdependence of these parts or variables. So the variables are all connected. They are all linked to each other. They are not separated and they are nonlinear. And uh, so the dy dynamical evolution of the most physical of most physical systems. So you have to describe them by differential equations and you cannot solve them by numerical methods. And so you cannot solve by uh, analytical methods. You have to use uh, numerical methods or computational methods. And, uh, and prediction, when you talk about uh, weather or climate prediction, 
it also depends on the scales uh, you have uh, uh, space and time scales going from meters to uh, several hundred uh, tens tens of thousand kilometers and uh, and also scales going from seconds to uh, year year years and decades so when we look at different phenomena you have short time scale processes like tornadoes and uh, uh, where it is mostly now casting or dust devil and tropical cyclones here severe storms and uh, highs and lows they come in the short and medium range weather forecasting the monsoons they come in the long range and seasonal forecasting the el nino it comes in the seasonal to interannual prediction and the long term climate prediction where climate change basically comes in that uh, uh, domain so we have to understand that there are uh, these phenomena they are linked to different space and time scales and uh, so when we use these models the physical principles uh, governing the flow basically goes back to the works of uh, newton going back to earlier days the momentum equation the newton's laws of motion uh, describing the horizontal uh, the rate of change of momentum when force is applied the energy equation what is known as the thermodynamic energy equation uh, the conservation of mass known as the mass continuity equation and then we also assume a hydrostatic equilibrium hydrostatic balance in the atmosphere this is important for re removing the gravity waves otherwise they are going to create problem you need hydrostatic ba balance and uh, then we also need water vapor that's an important uh, quantity but that creates that's also a, a, a major research problems are because of the introduction of the water vapor and how it ch changes from one phase to other how it interacts with the the climate system the precipitation processes and uh, it's also linked to the temperature equation so these are the harmless looking physics terms and uh, many of these processes happen on within the grid, grid scale or the sub, sub grid scale processes and the question is how do you treat them that is the that is the challenge uh, so the basis of the weather and climate models are you have all the physical laws describing the motion uh, laws of motion the thermodynamics and the prediction rate of the change of temperature pressure velocities humidity and so on so you have uh, uh, millions of equation uh, when you and you have different levels in the atmosphere and uh, and typically when you start discretizing them in time and the time scale depending on the grid size could be as as small as uh, 10 minutes or even lesser so you end up with 10 million computations and as you increase the resolution the time step is going to get even smaller the number of computations are going to increase fourfold and uh, and also the variables that you have in your model this is just for the atmosphere now you include the ocean uh, ocean process if you couple the atmosphere your number of calculations are going to increase uh, by a large number and this is why you we, there is a need for going for uh, high high performance computing you need fast computers to do the number crunching and uh, and within the this is all we are, we are talking about the large scale but within the scale of a grid you have processes that are not resolved and uh, they are important for weather prediction for example this we call in our jargon as parameterization of the physical processes sub grid processes like clouds and how radiation interacts interacts with the uh, land with the atmosphere uh, the different forms of convection the turbulent processes the exchange of fluxes uh, orographic drag and so on so these are uh, they, they can they are not resolved in nwp models but they are currently they are parameterized and this is uh, this i'll be coming to this later on <clears throat> and uh, so when these developments were going on in the 1960s there was a famous work by ed lorenz he introduced a simple chaotic model of the atmosphere atmospheric convection it was a very simple model uh, of a, where the atmosphere is heated from below and cooled from above so basically atmospheric convection problem he had represented this by a simple three equations it's a nonlinear ordinary ordinary differential equation system of three equations three variables but they are non linear and it has some parameters sigma r and uh, b and what he showed was it has two regimes it can go from one regime to another regime and what we now call it as attractor 
However, the transition from one regime to another, another regime can be very chaotic. This is what he proposed. And, uh, this is, and he called this as a butterfly effect. In fact, when you start looking at this transition from one attractor to another attractor, it looks like the wings of a butterfly. <clears throat> but what he noted was an important contribution was that when you introduce a small uh, infin inf infinitesimal uh, perturbation in the initial conditions, soon the forecast skill is gone. So, and uh, so the transitions can be very, very chaotic. That's what he said. And uh, he discovered that even with a very perfect model, because the system of three equations is a very, very perfect system. And, and even if you have almost perfect initial conditions, the forecast will lose its skill in a finite amount of time. So he basically remarked that a, a butterfly in Brazil can change the forecast in Texas after one or two weeks. And this was mostly from an academic point of view, it was of great interest. Uh, and the forecasts were also becoming useless uh, after one or two days in the 60s. But now if you really see the progress in NWP, we are able to get forecast almost up to two weeks. This is the maximum limit of predictability that uh, Lawrence had proposed. So how is it that it, this, this success has been achieved? So there has been great effort to extract the maximum information at the initial time and improve the initial conditions. And uh, this is done through a process called the data assimilation in NWP. And this is some slides I've taken from the European Center who have really pioneered this progress in the NWP. And also there are success from India. I will be sh showing some of those examples and also from other weather prediction centers globally. So the process of data assimilation is where you combine uh, observations at intermittent times with the forecast of the model. And the observations can come from multiple platforms, from ships, from synoptic observation, from buoys, radio sondes, aircraft, satellites, sounders, winds, uh, <coughs> motion vectors, scatterometer winds, and so on. So, from the, so observations from multiple platforms are combined, and uh, at, at various times are combined with the model first guess, what is called, and they produce initial conditions which are in balance. And these are then used to make predictions, subsequent predictions. And this entire cycle goes on. And, uh, and now the interesting thing is, this is a, what is known as the anomaly correlation of the ECMWF 500 millibar height. Uh, this is the variations in the height anomaly at around uh, of the 500 HPA. This is typically around 5 kilometers from the surface. So the perturbations of this HPA, 500 HPA height anomalies, uh, in the y-axis are shown the skill. Uh, so when you have higher skill means you almost get around 100 percent, 100. And uh, how the evolution has happened right from the 80s, uh, because ECMW started in 1979 to the latest. So the blue lines are the three-day forecast. The solid line is the northern hemisphere. The dotted, uh, the light uh, blue line is the southern hemisphere. Blue is for three-day forecast. Red is for the five-day forecast. Green is for the seven day forecast and uh, yellow orange is for the 10 day forecast. What is impressive is you can see that uh, in the recent decades after the 2000, after the late 90s, both the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere, the skills are almost comparable because uh, thanks to the satellite data, uh, because southern hemispheric did, uh, region did not have much observations. Uh, in the earlier periods, now the, the observational coverage has, has improved in the southern hemisphere and that has led to the improvement in the forecast skills. That is a one clear message that you are getting so as comparable to what you see in the northern hemisphere. The other point is that if you see the forecast skill of uh, a five-day forecast in the recent times, it is it is comparable to the, uh, uh, the what you see of the three-day forecast skill what you saw in the 80s. So a five-day prediction is as accurate as a three-day prediction of the 80s. Similarly, a seven-day prediction, uh, which you see in the recent times, is as, as good as a five-day prediction what was in the 80s. And a 10-day prediction, what you see presently in the NWP, uh, is what, what was seen in a five-day five or seven-day 20, 30 years ago. So clearly, the skill of the NWP forecast has increased. 
because thanks to the data assimilation process, more observational observations have gone in better initial conditions. So the initial value problem, the NWP is a very successful story. And of course, I'll, I'll come to this problem. The 500 millibar height is more of a mid-latitude circulation indicator. How about the tropics? I'll come to this later at the end. There are still challenges. And uh, and also there has been there have been improvements in prediction of the synoptic system, tropical cyclones, uh, both on the NW, both on the short and medium range. And this is just to give an example of the ensemble predictions of the Amphan super cyclone in May 2020, uh, IAT from IMD and NCMRWF. Very remarkable progress. Uh, you can see this was on on, 20, on 20th May. The cyclone made the landfall in Kolkata, and uh, these are the Doppler. Uh, weather radar images which uh, shared by Partha and uh, the strike probability is this is from the GFS ensemble forecast and by the way now these are not one, mem one member we have multiple ensembles looking at so numerical weather prediction is more of ensemble prediction you have not it's not a deterministic forecast you have ensembles of predictions so the, the track prediction as well as the strike probability is very very impressive and uh, Partha was telling me that the, the, the uh, 17th uh, prediction from the 17th May initial condition, the track error is something less than 50 kilometers. And uh, so likewise, the NCMRWF uh, predictions from the NCOM and the uh, NEPS, the Global Ensemble Prediction Systems, also showed remarkable uh, prediction skills. So these are our own home, homegrown models. So again pointing to a big successful story in the NWP and uh, uh, and when we look at the tropical predictions now when we look at the cloud systems very organized like the uh, what are seen the major cloud clusters with the MJO some of them move westward and the uh, cloud clusters slowly slowly moving eastward and uh, what is shown on the left panel is from the Meteosat and uh, what is shown on the right panel is the ECMWF forecast so you can see the skillful predictions four to five days in advance. Uh, these models are able to capture these uh, predictions. Again, uh, so it's a very uh, success story. And uh, basically then there was a recent very nice paper in 2015 uh, from Boyer, Thorpe and Brunet in Nature. Uh, they say that the NWP numerical weather prediction, it's a quite revolution. Uh, it has happened very silently and you can compare this problem is this success is comparable to the simulation of human brain or the evolution of early universe uh, the one inter important thing is this is performed every day at major operational centers around the world and uh, this is a typical example of a 36 uh, hour ensemble forecast uh, you have multiple uh, ensembles you have, uh, starting from different initial conditions trying to forecast precipitation. This is shown over a mid-latitude region over the UK. And uh, you can see that uh, there is a way of combining these different ensembles and making an estimate of the probability of precipitation. And uh, this is this is the way we, uh, this will be required even in the Indian context. I will be coming to that. But there are, there are challenges when we talk about uh, extreme precipitation and so on. I'll come to that. So the NWP has been a success story. And how about the science of climate change? Uh, the science of climate change is also another success story when it comes to the global change in the global mean temperatures, the effect of the human influence on that. We have a very good understanding on that. And this, this science started long back in the, uh, in the eight, around even much before 1850s uh, from the time of Joseph Fourier who talked about the uh, concept of glass bowl effect, how the atmosphere can insulate the radiation that is going out of the uh, planet. And uh, John Tyndall also demonstrated that the atmosphere admits, he said that it admits the entrance of solar heat, but checks out its exit. And as a result, uh, there's a tendency of heat to accumulate the heat at the surface of the planet. But a remarkable contribution was the quant by Swanti Arrhenius in 1896. He quantified how much if you if the carbon dioxide which is basically which traps the outgoing radiation if that was to be doubled what would be the change in the surface temperature he approximately estimated it to be five degrees and uh, there were other studies trying to look at the uh, temperature variations in different uh, guy calendar 
he noted how human activities had contributed to surface temperatures and the measurement of carbon dioxide basically when important contribution came from Charles Keeling the establishment of the Mauna Loa facility for detection of atmospheric composition change which has been going on from 57 to present and then in 1560s Manabe and Strickler they pioneered uh, they first developed uh, radiative convective models, one-dimensional models of the atmosphere, uh, looking at the vertical profiles of the temperature and the humidity and uh, how that is going to alter the uh, uh, infrared radiation and what happens to climate change. And uh, so the development of the RCMs was an important to understand thermal equilibrium. It came in 64 and uh, a landmark paper, Manabe Weatherall, that was a pioneering paper that talked about the thermal equilibrium of atmosphere with a given distribution of relative humidity. He fixed relative humidity. It was a landmark contribution uh, considering it was in 1967. Otherwise, this problem would not have been even solved. They assumed a fixed relative humidity and they showed that if carbon dioxide was to be doubled in the atmosphere, what will happen? And more importantly, they showed the water vapor feedback effect. And what they showed was if you had the uh, in, more than the carbon dioxide, the presence of the water vapor is going to double the warming. And uh, so they noted that in presence of uh, uh, variable water vapor uh, <clears throat> with the realistic distribution of the absolute humidity, the temperature of the planet would increase surface temperature by about 2.3 degrees instead of just 1.3 degree with fixed, with fixed absolute humidity. And there has been a very thorough review of these uh, RCMs and climate modeling by Ramanathan and Coakley in 1978. It's a very nice article. So the science of climate change has also developed. So the so the so basically the earth system models are very important tools to understand this because these are all, it is not just the atmosphere, the oceans, the cryosphere, biosphere, they're all interacting. And we have to understand the, uh, understand the, information about these systems and how the rates of changes of element in different earth system components are behaving. And uh, in the 80s also the first couple model, so the recognition that to study climate change you need not just the atmosphere, the atmosphere and ocean coupled model, they need to be coupled, the ocean and the atmospheric components. And this is a schematic from Manabe and Stauffer, uh, his professor Suki Manabe, he pioneered the development of the coupled modeling at GFDL. And I had the good fortune of working with him in Japan for two years. And uh, later on, uh, people also, various contributions came in understanding the ocean dynamics uh, as a, the, uh, the thermohaline circulation, the ocean conveyor belt, the deep ocean circulation, also the carbon cycle, the biological processes. Uh, ocean general circulation models, Kirk Bryan also made major contributions in the GFDL. So, uh, they are all the pioneers and uh, importance of biosphere as a dynamic component of uh, the earth system. Uh, Bernatsky's early contribution of how biosphere is important, how life forms and organisms contribute to the climate. He had recognized that. Then the vegetation albedo feedback uh, for the Sahara, changes in the Saharan precipitation. Charney had proposed this. and. Uh, Changes in uh, carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide, missing carbon link. So Charles Keeling and the uh, role of the biosphere in controlling the chemical composition of the atmosphere and uh, also the trace gases. So a major contributions also from wildfires from Paul Crutzen. Independently, the atmospheric chemistry also developed uh, starting from the stratospheric ozone uh, uh, Chapman's theory of photochemical uh, processes that lead to the ozone form formation. Uh, and then the, the, the stratospheric ozone depletion problem, uh, Krutzen, Molina and Roland, which won them the Nobel Prize in 1995, was an important uh, discovery. And also the photochemistry of smog. Uh, and uh, also there, there are also new st other studies on talking about the oxidation potential, the hydroxyl radical which is basically a cleansing ra radical how it, how it can how it's important in understanding the atmospheric chemistry so various developments have happened and the climate model development itself in the 70s there were standalone atmosphere and ocean models in the 80s uh, mid 80s uh, they had introduced vegetation CAs and also the atmosphere and ocean models were coupled 
by 90s they started uh, modeling groups could in incorporate aerosols uh, basically the sulfate emissions coming from the europe and north american region and because they altered the incoming solar radiation what is its effect on the on the climate and also the effect of volcanic uh, eruptions and the sulfates uh, sulfate emissions going aerosols going into the stratosphere carbon cycle processes were uh, being included started in 90s and uh, so further refinements have happened in the 2000s uh, inclusion inclusion of the biogeochemical cycles the interactive vegetation and uh, now in in the in the recent times there is effort to include the ice sheet dynamics so the coupled climate modeling and earth system modeling has evolved and uh, the the processes more processes more components are being involved and bigger groups and the computational power has also increased and in this context uh, i should mention that the iitm we developed the first earth system model which was basically we transformed a seasonal prediction the cfs model for a long term uh, climate prediction we had coupled a new version of the mom 4 p1 with interactive biogeochemistry it was a work done at iitm it was a home grown development and uh, it was published in 2014 however this model had serious radiation imbalances even in 2014 and uh, later on in uh, 2018 we had an update this is the iit version 2 where we have fixed the radiation by which i said is very important for any climate model and uh, so the radiation balance both at the top of the atmosphere and at the surface uh, those imbalances have been fixed these were occurring due to problems major problems coming from the Uh, melting of the arctic if there was excessive melting in the polar regions of the arctic ice sea ice and this would affect the ocean deep ocean circulation the thermohaline circulation and the ssts would cool and uh, whereas more of heat would penetrate into the deeper deeper ocean so there were ma major uh, so the net radiation biases were very large so we wanted to first fix this problem of the arctic ice cover Uh, this problem has been remedied, and uh, and this is the version ATM ESM V2 that is going to the CMIP6. And when we address climate change, we also have to understand there are various feedbacks within the climate system. As I said, the water vapor feedback. Uh, so when uh, when the temperature increases due to greenhouse gases, the water vapor is also going to increase due to what is known as the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. For every one degree of warming. water vapor in the atmosphere is going to increase by 7 to 10% and water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas and it's going to absorb the long wave radiation and amplify the the temperature response similarly the ice albedo feedback so if you are going to decrease the ice uh, the albedo is going to decrease and uh, so the warming is going to increase that's a positive feedback likewise you can have vegetation feedbacks so when we address climate problem feedbacks are very important and this is the example of how we improved the uh, northern hemispheric sea ice in the iitm esm v2 which was underestimated in the v1 and uh, because of this improvement uh, we have the improvements major improvements in the thermohaline circulation which is basically a, a global conveyor belt where where you have the cold waters very cold and salty it's very dense water sinking in the north atlantic and it takes several hundreds of years uh, to establish the circulation and then uh, at the surface you have the warm waters going from the from the equatorial from the tropical areas to the high latitudes so there is this big conveyor belt and uh, getting this uh, thermo now this is also known in the literature as the atlantic meridional overturning circulation so with the melting of the sea ice and also the greenland ice sheet one of the potential changes is major changes that we can expect in the climate system is changes in the amox circulation the atlantic meridian overturning circulation this can have major impacts on the climate and uh, so in the first version of our esm1 uh, even the cfs model uh, there is excessive melting of the sea ice so the the salinity uh, is very very it's very fresh in the esm v1 uh, because of the excessive you are adding more fresh water the amox is practically absent in the version 1 also in the cfs and this we have remedied so the deep ocean circulation is now very clearly coming out in the amox in the in the new cfs in the esm v2 and this has happened through a very comprehensive understanding of these processes coupled processes 
and we have improved this and we also looked at not just those ex polar areas also looking at the monsoon we have a new convection scheme uh, which is basically interaction with parthas group working on the nwp and uh, we have a new uh, revised sas convection scheme this has improved our representation of the monsoon you can see precipitation extend despite a lower resolution uh, the version v2 is a t62 it's about a 200 kilometer grid compared to the version 1 which is a t126 about a 106 kilometer grid so despite a low resolution the the monsoon precipitation you can see the plumes extending into the indian region and with the higher resolution this definitely captures the tropical precipitation is good so we have removed some of the dry bias precipitation bias in the esm v2 uh, thanks to the new convection scheme and uh, uh, this model also includes uh, ocean biogeochemistry uh, because there is a lot of uh, marine uh, productivity, primary productivity going on. Uh, even both in the Indian Ocean, we have these regions during the summer monsoon time, there is active upwelling uh, in, the, in the Arabian, the Somali coast, also in the Arabian Sea, uh, which brings a lot of nutrients and algae, uh, which, are, which are basically plants. And, uh, and they absorb the sunlight and carbon dioxide and they produce, uh, uh, they produce food, uh, they do photosynthesis and these are then consumed by other organisms and uh, various uh, zooplankton and marine organisms and these are then consumed by uh, higher, uh, bigger, bigger animals fish and uh, other, other organisms uh, in, the, in the ocean. So there's entire biogeochemistry going on. And this is very important for the carbon cycle and also for understanding the exchange of fluxes across the ocean atmosphere uh, system. And this has been introduced in the IATM ESM. This is again based on the GFDL model uh, uh, known as the topaz, which, which introduces these different uh, tracers in the nutrients and in the organisms. They are intro introduced as 25 different tracers in the ocean model and uh, those processes are being represented. And uh, so we also compared the simulation. Now we have information about uh, the, the chlorophyll uh, or the ocean uh, algae. Uh, you can see from the satellites, this is from the CDIFS observation and uh, the bottom panel is from the IATM ESM simulation. You can see that uh, these are the Somali and the Arabian Sea coast you have associated with the summertime upwelling this uh, increase in the in the chlorophyll concentration and uh, there is consistency with what you see in the observation and also you see that in the western uh, equatorial pacific uh, where in the southeastern equatorial pacific you have a lot of upwelling of the peru coast and uh, so these uh, you have more chlorophyll production and those signatures are seen but in fact it is much more stronger in the model because the trade winds are stronger and uh, uh, so the, the upwelling is much stronger in the model compared to the what you see in the observations. And this is a typical example. This is in, important in understanding the biogeochemical process because when you look at the CDIFS data, this is from Wallace and Hobbs. Uh, this is January 1998. You had a very big the El Nino in 1997 that continued into 1988. And, uh, you can see the ocean color was reduced because the upwelling was reduced and the uh, temperatures were warmer. It's just sea surface temperatures were four, five degrees anomalously warm. And because of the reduced upwelling, the nutrients were also reduced. The chlorophyll content was also reduced at the surface. But by July 1998, you had a La Nina. You had more enhanced upwelling, strong trade winds. And you can see the widespread phytoplankton blooms in the equatorial Pacific. And these, the model should be able to capture. And uh, some of these uh, broad features are broadly captured uh, in the interactions of the chlorophyll, the winds, and the sea surface temperature in the Pacific, in the IATM ESM. I'm not going into those details. And this model also does a good job for the Indian Ocean dipole, which is an important mode, uh, which has links to the Indian monsoon. And there's also Equino, which is part of the IOD. And uh, we have looked at the uh, ocean atmosphere coupled interactions and also the biogeochemical process. Uh, one of our colleagues, Prajish, is working on that. So the chlorophyll variations, the SST variations, the wind and precipitation variations uh, in the IOD uh, in the Indian Ocean also are well captured in the IATM ESM. It's one of the good models 
that does it very good job we have also introduced aerosols in addition to greenhouse gases as it's as i said sulfate emissions and also emissions of black carbon and other aerosols uh, they can affect the incoming solar radiation either they can scatter like the sulfate aerosols they scatter the incoming radiation or aerosols carbonaceous aerosols like the black carbon they absorb the incoming radiation and uh, so the net solar radiation reaching the surface can be reduced and uh, so there are many areas in the in the northern hemisphere especially china and uh, in the 70s uh, of course europe has now cut down a lot of aerosol emissions uh, so china europe and uh, north america these were the area, lot of aerosol emissions in the 70s 80s it, china even continues to do that even now there are a lot of emissions and uh, so the aerosol forcing is substantial uh, due to the anthropogenic activities but unlike greenhouse gases which are long lived the aerosol are, these are much short lived uh, but the radiation effect on the on the short wave radiation on a regional scale can be substantial and these and they can in, introduce large gradients in the radiative forcing regionally and they can perturb your hydrological cycle and uh, so these are the uh, from the cmip6 model uh, experiments we have this uh, aerosol data that is given for all these models that participate in the cmip and this is the aerosol optical depth at 550 nanometers in the uh, in the visible and uh, this is the radiative forcing you can see a negative forcing at the top of the atmosphere and at the surface you can see a very large uh, reduction in the uh, negative forcing at the surface uh, because of the re reduced uh, uh, strong reduction of uh, radiation at the surface over the china region especially and also over the indian subcontinent and uh, so one of my colleagues uh, we have looked at the impact so we have this aerosol forcing dominating the northern hemisphere whereas the global warming dominating everywhere and when we add these two the northern hemisphere uh, there is a kind of aerosols kind of try to offset the global warming whereas in the southern ocean it is mostly dominated by the ghg effect and when we try to see the uh, precipitation response to the individual and combined effects of the aerosols uh, northern hemisphere uh, aerosol and ghg forcing we find that the combined effect of if you have more aerosols and also global warming the monsoon precipitation reduction can be even more substantial than just the aerosol forcing over over south asia and uh, this is a paper that is under review and uh, uh, so i will not go into these details so in summary we have the iitm esm it was a first version successfully developed and it had a new ocean model with biogeochemistry and the version 2 we reduced the imbalance we have a uh, at the top radiation imbalance at the top of the atmosphere and surface improved monsoon precipitation improved sea ice distribution over the arctic antarctic you have a good amop we have interactive biogeochemistry we are able to prescribe aerosol properties and uh, we have having a, even a hydrological balance through discharge of runoff and from land to ocean and this is contributing to the cmip6 and ipcc r6 assessment so i will quickly come to some of the projections that we have made and which are fed into our report uh, we have completed more than 2500 years of experiments with the iitm esm i will not get into all the details uh, and uh, for the cmip6 uh, generally compared this is a comparison of the global mean temperatures uh, we are taking the ssp what is shown uh, in numbers or the ssp 585 we compare between the cmip5 and cmip6 generally the magnitude of warming in the cmip6 is somewhat higher significantly higher in the cmip6 compared to the cmip5 and also this is seen in the precipitation response also in the sea level response and uh, now coming to the i want to touch upon our assessment of climate change report so we know what, what is the global climate change is happening what does it mean over india so we have recently published a report uh, from the ministry of earth sciences government of india this is led by uh, iitm and cccr uh, and basically this work uh, this book discusses the influence of human induced global climate change on the indian subcontinent it presents a synthesis of historical and future projected changes in the global and regional climate over this 
Indian subcontinent based on scientific literature, observations, climate model projections, and published IPCC report. It serves as a reference resource for researchers, practitioners in academia and industry and policy makers. So what we have covered, uh, basically the regional climate response, when you look at it, uh, this our region has unique land ocean geographical features. You have the high elevation features like the Himalayas, the Tibetan plateau, the Western Ghats, the Burmese mountains, narrow mountains, the Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal. And this region is, con uh, it has the strongest regional monsoon in the world. It's the main climate is dominated by strong monsoon size cycle. We have to keep this background in mind. So the questions we are asking is, what has happened in the past? What are the observed changes? What has happened in the past? Why it has happened? What has happened? How it has happened? And why it has happened? So this comes under the detection and attribution problem. And what are the future projections? What are the expected changes in the future? And uh, so the main focus of this report is on the physical climate system. We are not going into the impacts. We are basically looking at the science of climate change, the physical system. This is basically a regional analog of the IPCC working group one. And what we and there are 12 chapters where we looked at the temperature changes over India, the mean, the extremes, the heat waves, the humidity, precipitation changes. It includes Southwest Northeast monsoon, mean variability, teleconnections, uh, basically, the precipitation is also there are a lot of teleconnections with ENSO and uh, IOD and Equino and uh, precipitation are linked with uh, teleconnection mechanisms. And we also looked at the wet and dry extremes, floods and droughts and what are the underlying processes. There's a chapter on the uh, greenhouse gas concentration and flux measurements, the work that goes on at IATM, also the atmospheric aerosols and trace gases. Uh, what are the how they have changed? What are the radiative forcing in direct indirect effects? And also our own ex experience from the cloud aerosol in the CAPEX program and the HPCL group, HACPL groups, they have given uh, they have contributed to this report report on the cloud aerosol interactions. There's a chapter on floods and droughts about the drought indices, links to precipitation, soil moisture, case studies of floods, synoptic scale systems, low pressure systems, monsoon depressions, western disturbances extreme storms, tropical cyclones, thunderstorms, sea level rise uh, in the Indian Ocean, what are the drivers, what are the regional processes, variability, and how much is the thermospheric sea level rise that has happened in, in the historical during the uh, last century and in the future, how the Indian Ocean has been warming, the sea surface temperature, ocean heat content, what are the processes and mechanism. We have also looked at the Himalayan cryosphere, the temperature, the rainfall, snowfall, and uh, glaciers, uh, the elevation dependent warming in the, the Tibetan plateau. And we also, there's a focus on the Western disturbances and possible impacts. And uh, there's a very short chapter on possible impacts and policy messages. So this has been a very comprehensive uh, report. And uh, we, so while setting up the regional context, we understand that this region has a strong internal dynamics of the coupled system. You have the monsoons. We have the complex interactive processes, moist dynamics, organized convection, cloud systems, aerosol cloud interactions, atmosphere, ocean, land, biosphere, coupled, in, coupled interactions. There is a large internal variability of the couples on different space and time scales. So when I say internal, it is all within the climate system. There is no human influence. So that we have to keep, keep in mind. And we know that the processes, climate variations on different time scales have teleconnections, they have links to various modes of variability, like the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation in the Pacific, the Indian Ocean Dipole in the Indian Ocean or the Equino, the atmospheric component of that. On, on longer time scale, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, the Madden Julian Oscillation, which is uh, on the 30 to 60 day time scale, as well as the polar and extratropical connections. So this we have to keep in mind. This is also assessed in the chapters. Uh, natural forcing, we also know that climatic force uh, variations caused by vo large volcanic eruptions which inject stratospheric aerosol, uh, sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere, solar irradiance cycle uh, uh, changes due to the so solar 11 year cycle, uh, what are its impacts and, and then the anthropogenic forcing, there is a human induced change due to the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and uh, uh, nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide, methane aerosols, both sulfate nitrates, organic carbon, black carbon, dust, 
land use land cover changes changes in the forest cover they are all important external drivers and they involve different physical mechanisms the mechanisms of ghg induced impact is different from the way aerosols impact so we have to keep these things and also understand the regional context when making these things and uh, this was led by more than 100 scientists uh, many of them from iitm and several of them from various institutes in india and uh, uh, different institutes uh, and more than 100 people it was rigorously reviewed several rounds of hydrations have gone and uh, finally this assessment report after having uh, thoroughly re reviewed this revised this and then this report has been prepared and when i said about the just to give you an idea about the in, in strong internal dynamics the monsoon is a very good example the indian monsoon this is a, a, a slide from yp rao on the indian monsoon showing the multi scale interaction you have synoptic different scales of monsoon when we look at precipitation you have uh, synoptic scales of motions and uh, and also very uh, like the depressions and low pressure systems and also the active uh, active break spells and then the large scale monsoon uh, and then you have the which is driven by the tibetan plateau uh, you have major heating during that time and then the 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 ocean which is relatively cooler and uh, you have a large sea gradient and then all these precipitating systems uh, uh, precipitation producing systems organized convection the mtcs and so on so it is truly interactive in nature the shaded region shows the areas which receive more than 100 centimeters of rain during a season climatologically so we are trying to ask a problem if climate change is going to happen how it is going to affect the monsoonal process this is really a very complex problem and uh, that we have to keep in mind and how did we how what was our approach to regional climate change assessment uh, we have to look at multiple lines independent lines of scientific evidence covering uh, key aspects of regional climate change and we have to distill regional climate information and knowledge and uh, this is based on distillation peer reviewed journals analysis from multiple observational data sets in situ satellite paleoclimate reconstructions reanalysis products state of the art climate model projections cmip phi cordex the iatm esm published assessment reports the ipcc ar5 ipcc special reports the moef environment forest and climate change the natcom reports the himap report all of them have fed into this and also we have included the first results from the cmip6 projections of the iatm esm are also presented because this is an important contribution and from from the cccr and from iatm uh, and uh, and the report preparation has been uh, led by more than 100 authors uh, various review editors expert reviews technical support team and various research institute universities academia and so on both national and international and this is a quick summary uh, the projection we have told the change in the summer monsoon rainfall uh, temperature over india we have a moderate scenario known as the rcp 4.5 uh, where we project about 2.4 degree warming uh, by the end of the century that is 2070 to 2099 and in the uh, middle uh, around 2040 to 2016 about 2 degrees whereas the rcp 8.5 this is a very high high emission scenario i'll come to this there are uncertainties we have to keep in mind this is a very high end this is not a business as usual it is a much higher than scenario than that this projects about 4 4.5 4.4 4 degree warming end of the century and uh, we also seen that there is a general increase in the monsoon precipitation both in the rcp and rcp uh, 4.5 and 8.5 uh, we have also projected given uh, uh, projections in the sst changes in the indian ocean changes in the uh, annual precipitation of the hindu kush himalayas and also the temperature and precipitation changes we have also documented that the temperature changes and are not spatially uniform they vary we have to keep that in mind and uh, and yeah this is just an example of the spatial pattern of the monsoon precipitation so from the iatm esm uh, so during the last 50 60 years uh, in general monsoon precipitation in some places over india it has increased but in several other places there has been a decline in the mean monsoon uh, over the indo gangetic plains and regions in the western ghats and the overall if you see the net that has declined by about 6 to 7% uh, 
and uh, this we are seeing this the model is able to capture in one of our uh, uh, long simulations uh, historical simulation of the iit mesm to some extent and uh, when we look at the future projection the ssp 5.5 Uh, with increasing the carbon dioxide, uh, more uh, more warming, there is going to be more water vapor increase, and uh, we expect increase in the monsoon precipitation over India. And extremes, uh, one with the increase of water vapor, as I said, six to ten, six to six uh, percent to ten percent for every one degree of warming. One of the immediate consequences: heavy rainfall, extreme rain events. are going to increase and this was shown by earlier papers uh, goswami et al in science in 2006 and rajivan et al more comprehensive this was for the entire right right from 1901 to 2004 they looked at very heavy rainfall events more than 150 mm per day they have increased significantly in over india or central india and uh, and so this is a very clear signal of uh, climate change and this is seen in several other places not just over india and uh, this is also assessed in our chat book and this is just a schematic uh, showing from a rcp 4.5 uh, scenario uh, uh, th in the left side what has happened in the historical past and uh, the right side uh, the pro uh, projections by the iitm both for the historical period and in the future based on the rcp ssp 4.5 it's a medium medium em emission scenario Uh, we can see the increase in the precipitation monsoon precipitation uh, with uh, increase in temperature over india and also there is an increase in the sea level over the northern indian ocean uh, there is a slight decrease in the himalayan snow cover uh, which is also assessed in this and the details can be found in this chapter uh, in various chapters of the book i also want to mention that when we talk about uncertainties Uh, when we talk about the rcp 8.5 this is a very very it's not a business as usual it's much higher than that and uh, in fact uh, the uh, in the ar5 uh, ipcc ar5 the the rcp concept was used which is a representative concentration pathway uh, uh, this is uh, this is basically it is a concentration trajectory adopted by the ipcc and uh, they describe different climate futures all of which are considered possible depending on the volume of greenhouse gases emitted in the years to come and uh, later on in the rcp in the in the recent times they have realized that the rcp is not a good scenario and uh, although it is it is thought to be less un, less likely very unlikely and uh, but still possible feedbacks are, are to be considered that's what is the assessment in the ar6 there is a new concept known as the ssp that is the so shared socio economic pathways and uh, these are uh, these are uh, basically based on the socio economic challenges for mitigation and also the socio economic challenges for adaptation and basically you have different scenarios the ssp5 are uh, uh, these are mit mitigation challenges dominated these are basically high emission scenarios whereas whereas the ssp2 and ssp2 is a kind of intermediate challenge scenario and uh, it's kind of a uh, middle of the road pathway uh, so we have to keep that keep that in mind uh, the rcp 8.5 is a very very unlikely scenario it's not a business as usual that we have to keep in mind and also when we talk about extremes we uh, there are a lot of knowledge gaps and when we talk about extremes uh, in the precipitation of regional uh, extremes uh, they are linked to remote effects for example uh, the arctic has been warming at a very fast rate this is known as the arctic amplification and uh, so since the 2000 the temperatures over the arctic have risen and the arctic sea ice has melt uh, dr dramatically it has decreased in the last 30 40 years and is projected to continue into the future also the greenland ice sheet has been melting and this is affecting some studies have talked about uh, changes in the emoc because of the ice sheet melting and due to these changes rapid changes in the warming in the arctic polar region uh, the temperature gradients between the mid latitude and arctic has has weakened and so the jet stream has weakened and started meandering and due to the meanders of the jet stream uh, it can introduce major 
extremes both in the mid latitude mid latitude region it can in introduce blocking for example the russian heat wave in 2010 has been linked to this effect and also el ninos are becoming very strong of late there's a, the 2015 was a very extreme el nino and which we had studied the monsoon we had two consecutive droughts 2014 and 15 the el nino impact so climate change is also affecting these extremes in the in the ocean the el nino phenomena and uh, so we have to keep these links in mind they are not just we just looking at uh, changes in water vapor and uh, pre precipitation associated with that and there are also circulation driven changes for example we had this heavy precipitation in uttarakhand in 2013 in june uh, it was a very the monsoon onset happened very very rapidly there was a low pressure system moving from the bay of bengal which so around by 16th of june um, there was a very rapid advance of the monsoon and there was a deep uh, mid latitude trough there was a big big blocking uh, uh, mid latitude blocking like uh, pattern very persistent structure and uh, this synoptic system from the bay of bengal uh, uh, moved from the bay into the into the indian region and there was the interaction between this mid, uh, monsoon system and the extra tropical circulation that produced this heavy rain and also there was a uh, heavy precipitation in the himalayan region and also some glacier uh, lake break uh, outburst which led to heavy flooding and uh, this is the shiva statue in uh, rishikesh this was eventually lost uh, so the scale of the impact was very large and this we have seen not just in 2013 uh, 16 to 20 but these events have happened in, in other cases also and uh, and also the pattern of sea surface temperature decade intraannual to decadal variations are also affected by climate change so in the last 50 60 years the progress that this is a very important slide i got from professor matsuno in one of his talk uh, what he said was in the last 50 years what we have really progressed in the atmospheric dynamics is mostly understanding the mid latitudes where the systems are driven by these large scale baroclinic waves the scale of these waves are very large and uh, that is what our revolution in nwp and in the climate has been in this but when you come to the tropics there are clouds become very very important and these are very uh, small scale systems but they can organize over longer scale and there are embedded precipitation systems we don't understand and the effect of the latent heating by clouds on the wind is very very small in the extra tropics so the extra tropic precipitation is driven by the circulation changes the big baroclinic weather systems but in the tropics it is the latent heating which can drive the regional scale circulation patterns and that is where it becomes it becomes a challenge and uh, this is a slide by so we need lot of research to look at the tropical processes and uh, this is a this is the kerala flood in 2019 uh, entire kerala was flooded very extreme rainfall and uh, partha gave me the slide on the gfs forecast so uh, on uh, on on the 9th of uh, august uh, you had almost 150 uh, 160 mm of uh, rain uh, uh, just in 24 hours and uh, unfortunately the models were unable to capture the gfs models uh, even in the one day forecast and uh, but if you do an ensemble forecast and do a probabilistic approach uh, take a probabilistic approach maybe there is a higher probability so his uh, his suggestion is model forecast if you look at the 9th august 2000 even so even if you take the uh, six day lead forecast there is a 90% probability if you base on a climatology plus one standard deviation instead of looking at the absolute rainfall itself or if you take the climatology plus two standard deviation maybe there is skill in five day forecast or uh, if you take a three standard deviation the lead time comes down so we have to take a probabilistic view in the forecast even for the cyclones which are likely to intensify in the future and uh, and also we under don't understand many of the uh, precipitation processes in the region for example this is the uh, this is a slide from shige et al he has looked at the trim the latest uh, data set which is a 16 year data set climatology based on the precipitation radar at 5 kilometers so the western ghat precipitation and cloud systems are very different from the bay of bengal systems and uh, his argument is that the orographic processes in the western ghat is very different from what you see in the bay of bengal and western ghats are more of shallow clouds but they can give very very heavy rainfall 
So we really need to understand how these uh, precipitation mechanisms are working. And this is an example of MTC. A few days back, we had heavy rainfall in Mumbai, 20, cent 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters in a day, in several places. And these events have been known earlier also in the 60s. They are linked, they are related to what are known as the MTCs, metropospheric cyclones. They form in the Gujarat and uh, Maharashtra region. And the circulation is mostly seen at mid-tropospheric level, and but they can produce huge amount of rain. And uh, understand within these uh, uh, systems, there are very organized cloud band, kind of typical active monsoon, ITCZ type of cloud band with embedded cloud systems. We have to understand the interactions across these scales. Likewise, our understanding of the aerosol and cloud interactions, uh, the indirect effects in the monsoon environment, a lot of open issues are there uh, and uh, now there are new techniques uh, looking at uh, extreme rainfall which uh, which are linked to not only regional they are linked to large scale teleconnections as well as uh, regional teleconnections how to look at them and there are approaches for deep learning uh, machine learning and image processing to understand earth system processes and uh, we have good thanks to computational facilities we have the fastest supercomputer in india and we have uh, future plans to develop the IATM Earth System model and go for higher resolution model and make projections at 27 kilometer. I'm not going into the details. These are our future plans. So there are several opportunities in weather and climate and uh, uh, modeling. There's explosive growth in uh, weather and climate modeling and also understanding the uh, machine learning and nonlinear dynamical systems, complex networks. And this can be used for a wide range of scientific and socio-economic applications. Technological advances in computing are also and big data are also becoming impo important. They need technically skilled workforce uh, to untangle the multi-scale nature of weather and climate processes. And there are huge uh, development of capabilities in weather, augmenting it and enhancing it is very important. There are several career options. I am not going to in meteorological, defense, agriculture, water resources, various national, international research labs, universities, departments, HPC, uh, industry, aviation, so on. In, in summary, the enterprise of building human resources in weather, climate and earth system modeling has enormous benefits for advancing scientific research, operational services and overall progress of society and nation at large. So, and I finally want to say that government of India has undertaken several activities and it's very committed to reducing GHG emissions. Uh, yeah, while the temperatures of uh, over India have increased by 0.7 degrees uh, during uh, the last since 1901 and projected to increase in, in the future, we should remember that there are uncertainties in the high emission scenarios like the RCP 8.5 and uh, uh, SSP, even the SSP 585. There is spread in the projections across climate models especially both at global and also at regional scales. And uh, there are also uncertainties and understanding external uh, feedback processes, external forcing, internal climate variability. So government of India is very much committed to reduce GHG emissions and already started taking many initiatives. Uh, at the highest level, India is committed to meeting its national commitments made to the international community through UNFCC and the Paris Agreement. In recognition of India's national efforts uh, towards climate change, Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji received the Champions of the Earth Award in 2018, a top UN honor that recognizes the contribution in the field of environment pro protection. As a result of India's proactive and sustained actions on climate change mitigation, the emission intensity of India's GDP has reduced. Uh, the emission intensity has reduced by 21% over the period 2005 to 2014. This is all from source from the Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India. International Solar Alliance is the vision of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji to bring the world together for harnessing the untapped potential of solar energy for universal energy access at aff affordable rates. With the joint efforts of India and France, ISA was launched in 2015 at Paris, which, which became the 21st treaty based intergovernmental organization located in India. Solar installed capacity in India has increased by about nine times from March 2014 to August 2018. The share of non-fossil fuel sources in installed capacity of electricity generation has increased from 2015 significantly from 
2015 to 2018 super critical thermal power units have risen uh, from 40 to 66 uh, gigawatts in uh, 66 with avoided emissions amounting to 7 million tons of carbon dioxide in 2016 17 the forest and tree cover growth has increased over india by 24% over total geographical area as reported in the india state of forest report india is partnering 22 member countries and the european union in the mission innovation on clean energy and is a co lead in smart grid uh, off grid and sustainable biofuels in innovation challenges and more than 312 million led bulbs have been distributed till october 2018 and under the unnat jyoti by affordable leds for all ujala program uh, basically the replacement of incandescent and cfl bulb by led bulbs has resulted in energy saving of about 40 billion kilowatt hours and reduction of 33 million ton of carbon dioxide per year as in october 2018 this is all from the uh, source from the ministry of earth science government of india so the government of india is also uh, taking all the right the, making all the right decisions and uh, there is a huge opportunity climate change is happening there but there are also huge opportunities in weather and climate modeling and uh, we need to do lot of research to understand some of the gap areas various gap areas and also promote uh, and this research has to feed to the operational services and the societal benefits so with this i want to end my talk thank you very much for your kind attention hello hello
Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. The, my, my, my mic was muted. So there are five questions. Uh, the first one is, what is equilibrium climate sensitivity and why is CMIP, why CMIP 6 models are showing higher sensitivity than CMIP 5? Yeah, equilibrium sensitivity is basically for a given increase in the greenhouse gases, what would be the increase in the global mean temperature of the planet? So there is a there's, there are ways to estimate this. And for the IATM ESM, it's between three to four degrees. Uh, we have estimated the equilibrium climate sensitivity. And it is true that CMIP-6 models are showing higher sensitivity than CMIP-5. The reason is not very clear because many of the feedbacks uh, can also affect how the sensitivity also depends on the changes as i said in the in the in the polar regions for example if you have uh, more melting of the ice uh, the albedo is going to decrease that can also the feedback process can also amplify the warming so so it does it involves several things so the so still a lot of work is going on to understand why you have a higher climate sensitivity in cmip6 and are there any robust evidence that solar cycle affects internal variability yeah, there is, um, yeah, for example, it can affect internal variability. We ourselves have done some work on, when we say it's not really solar cycle, we looked at the volcanic eruptions. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, several ensembles of the Krakatoa eruption in the IATM ESM. And these are very large eruptions. Uh, and they can really perturb the incoming shortwave radiation. And since they stay in the stratosphere for one or two years, they can affect even the ENSO and the monsoon. And uh, this paper will be coming out very soon. I'll be talking. And likewise, irradiance changes can affect. But the, the solar irradiance changes, the radiation changes are very small in the less than one, uh, one watt per meter squared. They can def definitely affect the internal variability. But, but making a long term impact on the change is still being uh, people are considering. Uh, it's an open area. And uh, why the precision of eccentricity is more, uh, eccentricity period is more than precision. No, these are all different uh, orbital parameters. So changes in the eccentricity, they happen on much longer time scale. Uh, it's it's 100,000 uh, 100, years. Precisional, precisional changes are much, so that is what is seen. And uh, this is, uh, there are works describing these orbital forcing mechanisms. And uh, so I think, uh, but I, I just, uh, and Milankovic did a lot of work on this. Question four, which parameters are mainly focused for modeling climate change behavior? Uh, focus uh, of natural plus, yeah, it depends where, which parameters. Basically, we have to look at temperature, precipitation, sea level, uh, ice. These are some of the key parameters. That's what we need to look at. Uh, but also the extremes. Extremes also become weather and temperature and precipitation extremes are also important. Why is there a contrast in Arctic amplification during boreal summer than the than the winter? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, why is yeah Arctic? Yeah, the, so the temperature changes in the extra tropics due to climate change. Uh, they are more dominant during the, the winter. The trends are much warmer. That's true. Than, uh, than the summer. This has again something to do uh, because in the winter also the jet stream is very strong. The feedbacks uh, between the uh, the circulation and the moist processes are strong in the winter time uh, than the when I say boreal winter, and that may be the reason because uh, in the northern winter there is a lot of storm tracks in the mid latitudes. Uh, that produce a lot of precipitation in the extra uh, tropical areas uh, that is dominant in the winter time. So the moist processes could be one of the reason. And also the temperature contrasts between the ocean and land is very strong in the winter. Jet stream is stronger during the winter. So the signals are more strong in the winter than the, the Arctic amplification is stronger in winter than summer. That's, that is my understanding. What is the current status of our ability to represent diurnal variation in the tropics? Uh, I, I have, I've, I'm not an expert on that, but there are groups that are trying to incorporate this effects of diurnal on the precipitation. But this is happening mostly in the time scale of weather prediction. And uh, that's an important problem. And uh, is the ESM uh, effect, uh, in effect 
does it incorporate the effect of urbanization on climate change no we have not done that uh, at least not in the iit msm may now people are thinking about these uh, urban scale processes that, that thinking has now just started to have urban effects on the esm to include them to study climate change but right now the present models don't have those representations it's a very complex problem you are really getting down to very very small scales how sensitive are the feedback process in climate models with better c uh, ci's representation in uh, in the esm does the feedback process behave reasonably yeah this is something we have to see and uh, recently we have done some work on the with the iit msm with the improved cis and improved amoc uh, if you have uh, if you add fresh water and heat fluxes in the north atlantic and the arctic region what is going to the happen to the monsoon this is a paper published in climate dynamics by my colleague sandeep uh, et al and uh, it 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 does a reasonably good job yeah hello hello ha uh, one uh, hello yeah i think i'm is there any other question uh, have you uh, completed all the questions yeah 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 you, you have addressed all the question thank you dr krishnan thank for you. a very informative talk and uh, spending time with this webinar series and answering all the queries yeah yeah, yeah. thank you uh, it was very good thank and uh, thank you very much thanks a lot yeah, thank you thank you thank you yeah. thank you now we can go offline computer team please switch off hello